Well, Broadway fans, we are in the heart of Tony season this spring in New York, and one of the hottest musicals right now that's debuting is Hades Town. I'm sitting here, my name is Sam Ekman from Gold Derby, and with me is Hades himself, Patrick Page. Thanks so much for joining me, Patrick. Uh, I, this show, you know, it's it uh, takes Greek myth and sort of a jazz age, Great Depression era, um, and then you're playing this Greek god Hades. That sounds to me like such a sandbox to play in as an actor. So how did you go about uh, getting inspiration? What got you in, inspired when you were creating this role? Really, the thing that inspired me the most with it was the music itself. That's what drew me to the project initially. I heard they were looking for an actor who might be able to sing really low. And uh, so I, this is way back before it was done at uh, New York Theater Workshop off Broadway. I downloaded the album and I listened to Hades songs, Greg Brown singing, Why We Build the Wall and Hey Little Songbird. I was like, wow, I've never heard anything like that on Broadway before. And I need to, I need to be part of this. And I had also heard that Rachel Chapkin was directing and I had just seen Great Comet. And I was like, I gotta work with her. So I called my agent and asked them to set up a meeting and they did. And that that's really how I've gone into it is through the music itself, through Anais's music and through her lyrics, which are uh, like, like little poems. Hmm. You, you mentioned New York Theatre Workshop. Uh, you've been involved since then. It's gone to Canada. It has gone to London. And in each iteration, it's really changed quite drastically. What do you learn from each new time the show gets produced? I learn, first of all, that I, I, I'm satisfied way more easily than Rachel or Anais are. Each time I think, oh, it's perfect, leave it alone. <laughs> and, uh, and they always know how to make it better. And um, so we did it first in this environmental setting at New York Theatre Workshop, which I loved. And I loved being that close to the audience. We walked through the audience. Uh, and it was really kind of a song cycle there, I think, uh, uh, with a lot of handheld microphones and such. It was really like a concert um, version, but somewhere between a concert and a musical, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next step along the way to see if it worked in a proscenium setting, we did it in Canada. And, um, and it did work wonderfully in a proscenium setting. And we saw how that affected audiences. And somehow, I don't know, it seemed to work even, even better. And then when we did it at the National Theater in London, they took it another step and uh, each time. And now this new production on Broadway, each time it's gotten stronger, deeper, and richer, the audience responses have gotten um, better and better and better. And, and, and I think all of the performances have deepened. Um, and you're, you're playing Hades, as I said. Uh, your Persephone is Amber Gray. Uh, again, we're going with the Eurydice and Orpheus myth here. And she's been with it along with you basically since the beginning. What's it like getting to create over such a long period of time with someone? Uh, because your your relationship with her is really central to the story. Yeah, I mean, it's just a relationship of absolute trust and comfort. Um, and I really, I really believe that 99% of my performance is Amber. Um, because what I do is I just look at her and respond to her. And I, and I think that Hades, in spite of the fact that he's king of the underworld and he's this CEO, fat cat, and all of that. What he is fundamentally is a husband who's afraid his wife is falling out of love with him. And that's what he is at his core. And that's what everything is based on for me in the show. Um, I, I build Hades Town. I build the wall because I want to impress her, because I want to keep her in, and I want to keep the people who want, want to take her away from me out. You know, everything for me is based in. Uh, in the character of Persephone, and especially in Amber's embodiment of it. So for me, it's, that's like my anchor, that's my rock. And uh, I've told her, I said, you can never leave the show because I can't do it with you. <laughs> well, hopefully you stay together then. Uh, I want to talk about that song. Uh, you have a song called Why We Build the Wall. It's one of your big numbers. 
Now, Aeneas wrote this back in, uh, that was part of the original, I think, back in 2010 with the concept album. Uh, but people have sort of put on a lot of meaning into it uh, because we're living in this era where there is a wall, a literal wall being discussed in uh, at the Mexican border. What does that song mean to you? And what, what is it like to perform that each night? Well, you know, you said something interesting. You said people have put a lot of meaning on it. Actually, I think when they make it a song only about um, Donald Trump and a, and a wall on our southern border. They've, they've taken meaning away from it rather mm. than added to it. I think the, the, the metaphor of the wall, the image of the wall is one as old as time. From the very beginning of time, people who wanted to lead other people, and, and particularly uh, in some kind of autocratic way, um, who wanted to be an ultimate leader and only leader, those people have said there, there are people out there who are scary and I'll put a wall between you and them and we'll keep the good people on the inside and the bad people on the outside. And that's just such a fundamental idea. And it makes such sense to people um, at, at, a, at a visceral level. And so Donald Trump tapped into something which Aeneas had already tapped into. So when people say, you know, did Aeneas uh, use Donald Trump's wall? I always say no, but I think that Donald Trump may have used Aeneas's wall um, because Aeneas is, is using an archetype, something that's, um, you know, the thing about archetypes is we share them through all, all colors. A wall means certain things. It means safety. It means security. It means there's something there that we need to be protected from. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a super powerful song. And the song... The, the circular logic of the song, the fact that the final thing we come back to is we build the wall because building the wall is what we do. Um, the wall is self-sustaining and um, the wall is what gives us work, which is really kind of like the military industrial complex, isn't it? I mean, we, we have all these, we make these bombs and they keep the economy going, but if we were to ever use them, everything would be destroyed. So. I don't know, I, it was one of the first things that hooked me into the show was the, not just the song musically, but um, the, the genius of the, of the thinking behind this song. I think, it's, I think it's one of the great folk songs of all time, I really do. Yeah, the, uh, one of your biggest calling cards, I would say, you've worked in a lot of things, but I think one of the things you're really known for is uh, this great deep voice that is so rare on Broadway. Was that, and this song shows it off quite well, was that something that was always a part of the character or how much of that was tailor-made for you when you entered? I think it's because the, the singer who first embodied Hades on the concept album was Greg Brown and has a really deep bass voice. Um, and Aeneas used that to embody the Lord of the Underworld Sometimes people ask me, what do you have to do in order to play a god or in order to play, you know, the king of the underworld? I say, well, that, that works really kind of done for me by Aeneas. The, 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 where she wrote the role tells you that he's not precisely human. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly with Orpheus, where she wrote that role, how high she wrote that role tells you that he's otherworldly as well. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful operatic tradition you know, that she's embraced in this, in this folk opera. Another area of theater you've become very well known for is all of your Shakespearean roles. Uh, and this show, anytime, it's mostly sung, but even the parts where it's spoken is all in verse. It's sort of rhyming couplets. Were you able to kind of pull from your Shakespearean background? Uh, it's kind of like a similar mythic. Sure. Kind of you know, the thing about a, a soliloquy in Shakespeare is that people speak in soliloquy when they really have no other option. They don't have anyone else they can turn to. Um, Hamlet turns to the audience when he, there's no one else he can turn to. Uh, and uh, as do all of Shakespeare's characters when they soliloquize. So when I get to the soliloquy in the, in the final act of the final movement of the show, um, it's where Hades is out of allies. You know, he can't talk to Hermes. He can't talk to Persephone about it. There's no one he can go to. 
except the audience. And he turns to them and, and, and can't go to the fates anymore. And essentially says, what, what do you think I should do? And so, yeah, that's the idea in Shakespeare. Of course, Shakespeare's plays were performed initially in an outdoor space where everybody shared the same light. Everybody could see one another. So the idea of denying the audience's existence wasn't an option. They were there. It would have been silly to pretend they weren't. And so for me, the audience is always present in, in whatever I do. You mentioned um, the word archetype before, and I wanted to go back to that because you're playing uh, you know, the villain. It, it's a classic archetype, but we also get moments where you genuinely, the audience genuinely feels for Hades, uh, you know, with his uh, moment with Persephone when he, he sort of finds that moment of song with her. Um, how did you approach that aspect of it, having this archetype, but there's something very human about him? Yeah, um, I think it's valuable always to ask yourself, what, what's the essential character trait that if you miss that one, you've missed the boat on the character? And for me, with Hades, it's that he's a husband who's in love with his wife and he's a great loser. there. It's not, you could go down the wrong street if you said the essential character trait is that he's a businessman or the essential character trait is that he's an autocrat. And those would be easy things to go toward. But I don't think it's right. I think what he is essentially in his heart, in his core, is a husband, a lover, someone who's terribly afraid of losing the one person that makes his life worthwhile. And that's something we can all connect with. So even though he does things in the play which um, are regrettable and which are terrible, you know, he has Orpheus beaten up and, and uh, tries to keep Eurydice against her will and so on and so forth. He, he, um, he does stand for a kind of order and he does offer something in return. He offers security. He offers food. He offers shelter. And the, the, you have to give everything in return, but you do get something back. So I, um, I think the important thing with any character that's labeled a villain or an antagonist is not to judge them, try to see the world from their point of view. And with Hades, I don't think that's difficult at all. And the curious thing about uh, you playing this character is you're also reunited with Reeve Carney, who you both were, you were Spider-Man and Green Goblin uh, fighting off against each other in Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. And yeah. now you're again, you're again battling each other. What is it like re-teaming re with him after all these years? It's one of the great joys of doing this show is being back with Reeve. You know, he's one of my favorite people in the world. And uh, I'd always thought that he would be spectacular in this part. From the very first time I heard the album, it sounded to me like, oh, Reeve should be, he should sing this part. And um, so uh, at one point, Aeneas came to me and said, look, we've been trying to get a hold of Reeve Carney. Would you mind making a call or sending an email? We've been having trouble uh, getting a hold of him. And I was thrilled to try to put that together. Um, if I can take a deviation for a second, I, I wanted to You've written quite openly and honestly um, about your battles with depression, and it's very rare to see an actor so successful. I mean, you've performed all over off-Broadway stages in big shows like this one in Hadestown or The Lion King, and it's rare to see an actor, a successful one, be so open about a subject like that. Why was it important for you to open that window? Well, you know, it was... Strangely enough, it was an event. It was something that I hid for a long time, like many people do, because I think a lot of people think there's something wrong with them or that they're broken in some way or that they just can't handle life. Um, and when we were doing Spider-Man, after we finished it, I had, I had been treated. And after years of, of, um, of refusing to take any medication, thinking that I could just handle it with talk therapy and, you know, gutting it through and everything, uh, eventually, there was a point where I couldn't handle it anymore, and uh, I did find medications that worked for me. And uh, and we were doing Spider Man, and uh, I I won't mention any names because I don't know if the family with it appreciates me doing that. But there was someone in the show um, who uh, jumped off a bridge. Uh, and, uh, and 
killed himself. And I thought at the time, I, I had been hiding it, and I thought, now, if maybe he had known that I had gotten through that and that I had a medication that worked for me and a doctor that worked for me, maybe he would have come to me and said, hey, who's your doctor? What do you want? How do you do it? You know. And so I, I felt um, ashamed of myself that I had been hiding it. And so um, at, at one point, I think, the New York Times was interviewing me for a show, and they finished the interview, and at the very end of it, they said, is there anything else people should know about you? And I said, well, yeah, probably that event had just happened. I said, probably you should know this. And the response was really kind of remarkable because I had then so many people who wrote me privately and said, me too. Can you tell me what medication you take? Can you tell me which ones you've tried? Um, can you tell me who your doctor is? Can you tell me how long you've done this, how often it happens for you, and so on. And so it just turned out to have been a, a, a huge relief. It's like when you're hiding anything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and you stop hiding it, and you find out, A, nobody's judging you, and B, it's just such a weight not to be carrying around that you're hiding this anymore. Because one of the things that I think people who have depression do is they walk through life pretending that they're not depressed. I mean, I could be doing this interview with you right now and I could be super depressed and I could fool you and make you think that I'm not depressed at all. I used to do that all the time. And there are probably uh, people all around this building right now doing that. And so um, once you stop doing that, putting all that energy into pretending, it's a huge relief. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was very inspiring to see you open up in that manner, and uh, I think very important. Um, but if I, I can go back to Hades Town because we, I have to finish up and let you go. Uh, there's a lot of because it's dealing with a myth um, and these archetypes. There's a lot of things you can read into it. There's a lot of ways you can feel at the end. Uh, the way the show ends, I won't spoil it for people who haven't seen it yet. But um, what do you hope that people walk away from the theater feeling? You know, I feel like we're at a point in all of our lives, in our national history in particular, where what we need is a reminder that our voices matter, that it, it, it and that there is hope. And I think the thing about Hades Town is that every night we do it, it ends with hope. It ends with hope that it is a tragedy, you know? The story of Orpheus and Eurydice is a tragedy, and Hermes warns you about that. The very first lines of the play is, listen, this is a sad song I'm going to tell you right now. But it ends with the idea that maybe the next time we sing it, it'll turn out differently. And, um, and that's something I feel like I know I need right now, and I feel like a lot of people I know need as well. Well, that's a great place to leave it with some hope. Uh, Thank you so much for joining me, Patrick. Everyone, stay subscribed to Gold Derby. We'll keep you uh, up to date on all the developments in Tony's season with all of our Broadway news. Thank you once again. Have a great day, Patrick. Thank you. Great to talk to you. You too.